even though we still need to stay physically distant, Westwood remains a bustling community with lots of things going on. Please visit westwoodunitarian.ca to view our online social calendar and discover more ways to connect. Our first hymn this morning is Gather the Spirit, played by Steve Bell. of a Westwood service, whether in person or online, we pause to affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous culture, history, and spirituality. Westwood's building resides in Amuskegee, Waskahagan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills. It is located on Treaty 6 territory. It is a traditional home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoto Sioux, and many others. Before my ancestors arrived, there were people here, and they still exist to this day, diverse nations of people who build complex societies, civilizations, and cultures, and have over a span of many, many generations. As treaty people, we are partners in the stewardship 
of the land we rely on, responsible for the impacts of our choices, responsible to the ancestors who came before us, and responsible to future generations. In the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization, we express our solidarities with Indigenous communities in their fight for self-determination. I would like to light this candle this morning. Thank you. Welcome and good morning, everyone. My name is Heather McLean Smith and my new pronouns are she and her. It is my honor to be your service leader this morning. I'm so excited to introduce our guest speaker, my very own big sister, Dawn Smith, pronouns she and her. Dawn is joining us from Victoria this morning. Good morning, Dawn. There are many helping hands that comprise Westwood. They keep our website updated, our services uploaded to YouTube, plan our worship services throughout the year, answer emails, as well as oversee the governance of our Westwood community. I want to thank each of you for your contribution of your time and talents to our beloved community. I know that the pandemic has made me feel tired and worn thin. I want to let you know that I feel rich beyond measures to have one another at this time. I'd like to especially thank Alara Stefan Gadet, pronouns they, them, for their tech support and providing the slide, slide deck this morning. I'd also like to thank our musicians, Rebecca Patterson, pronouns she, her, and Steve Bell, pronouns he, him, for their musical contributions. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we come together each week to learn more about what it means to be human how to stay compassionate through disagreement, how to uphold our principles and stretch into the discomfort. We are not here because we figured it out, all of life's greatest questions, or because we think we got it right. We come here to learn more about how to be in relationship, how to listen, how to agree to disagree, how to create trust and compassion in one another, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable. We come here to consider ourselves, to give ourselves pause, to think, to feel. We come here to discover just how we can use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder. With that in mind, during this service, I invite you to check in with your body. During this stressful time, many of us are spending hours and hours per day in front of a screen. But here, in this space, I want to assure you that it's okay to eat, pet the cat, change the baby, fold the laundry, or whatever it else it is that you need to do while you're tuning in. Video on, video off listening and participating can look like many different things. Thank you for showing up this morning from wherever you may be. This is a place where you are invited to rest, grow and serve the world. Welcome one and all. I'm gonna read our chalice lighting and then I invite us all to light our candles together. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from the, it's an excerpt from the book, One Drum, written by Richard Wagamese. It begins, as all things do, with stories. When our ancestors gathered around their tribal fires, stories were told. As a human family, we have this tradition in common. Many have forgotten their beginnings, but next time you are out with people and it is a summer night and a campfire is lit, watch how everyone responds to it. As night falls and the flames climb higher, people, regardless of their cultural background, will lean in towards the flame. Some will cup their chin to their hands, Others will lean back in their chair and idle there, never taking their eyes off the flame.
The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition at Westwood, along with many other Unitarian Universalist congregations. I invite you to take your messages of joys, sorrows, connection, love and support to and from each other into the chat as we listen to a beautiful composition of simple song composed by Lyle Lovett, played by Steve Bell. Thank you everyone for sharing. I like this final candle for all the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts, spoken or unspoken. Please join me in Westwood's affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, 
to serve the spirit of life in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood is a self-sustained community sustained and maintained by its membership. There are many ways to donate to Westwood, including by volunteering time, sharing your talent, or donating financially. E-transfers can be made to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Thank you for your generosity and continued support. Now, let's sing along with Rebecca Patterson. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Now the good, good stuff. I am one of those lucky people who would be fast friends if I'd met my sister at a potluck. Of course, that is not at all how we met. Dawn, our beloved mother, and I first walked through the doors of Westwood Unitarian in the fall of 1999 at approximately this time of season. Dawn, mom, and I were active members of Westwood for many, many years. Dawn moved to BC in the mid 2000s. And recently, Dawn graduated from the School of Community and Regional Planning at the University of British Columbia with a specialization in Indigenous Community Planning. I could not be more proud of her. She has won numerous, numerous awards in her field already, and I look forward to hearing more about what drew her to Indigenous community planning. Please welcome Dawn. Thank you so much, Heather. If I hear some thumbs, see some thumbs up from folks, if you can hear me okay. Excellent. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. I'm excited to share some words with you today. And remember how to do PowerPoint on Zoom. So in our time here together, uh, there's sort of three steps that I want to take you through. I'll start by introducing myself. And then I'll talk a little bit about what Indigenous community planning is and give you a few examples of what it looks like. I think you should be interested in Indigenous community planning because it's exciting and inspiring, but it also has some important things to say about the role of non-Indigenous people in improving our actions and making the world a better place. So in the third part of my little uh, sharing with you today, I'll close with some offerings of ways that I've learned to be a better person that may be useful to you and in your own work. It's important first to introduce myself. First, because I want to be polite and friendly, but also because introducing myself is part of how I explain how I came to know what I know and why I think that knowledge is important. This is critical because what I know and how I know it is not disconnected from my family, which I share with Heather, and the broader history of white people in Alberta. There isn't an objective, neutral source of knowledge. Everything I know and how I know it comes from the bathwater of who I am and how I was raised. So. Let's start there. My name is Dawn because it's my father's favorite time of day. And as all of you know now, Heather is my sister. On both sides of our family, we are white settlers, meaning that our ancestors came to Canada by choice and that they mostly came here for cheap land and to participate in the business opportunities of building out a new country. I'm grateful that those ancestors came to Canada. My life is admittedly better than it would have been if they had stayed in Ireland or Scotland. But I'm aware that the impact of my family coming to Canada was very, very harmful to the Indigenous people who were already living and thriving here. So that's the first part of introducing myself. The second thing to say is that I'm Unitarian. My family came to Westwood in around 1999 to about 2002 while we were living in Edmonton. And you started me on my path towards social justice and care for others. While I was living in Ontario as an undergrad, I went to the Grand River Congregation in Kitchener-Waterloo. 
I haven't settled into a new congregation yet on the island. Thank you, COVID. But Unitarian Universalism continues to be part of how I see the world and how I organize my pathway forward. And finally, I just graduated from the Indigenous Community Planning Program at UBC. The program is co-directed with Musqueam Nation and UBC. So I've been studying planning and specifically Indigenous community planning for the last two years. I would describe myself as a planner specializing in Indigenous community planning. Before I go further, I want to say a few thank yous. My Indigenous professors have taught me the importance of gratitude and saying thank you. It's a way to strengthen community connections and to build strong hearts. It's also important because we need to have strong hearts to do the work that's before us. It is going to take a very long time. We need to keep our hearts up and our hearts connected to one another and help others to do the same. So I want to say thank you to Westwood for inviting me here today and for the way you shaped who I am, how I move in the world and my family. I want to say thank you to my late mother, Sheila McLean, who many of you knew. She raised me and my sisters with the desire to make the world a better place. And she told us some hard truths as children. Back in the 1980s, she told me about the Indian residential school system, which was unusual for that time. We didn't talk about it in our homes. And finally, I want to say thank you to the broader community of Indigenous scholars and practitioners, especially Jess, Jesse Hempild and Maggie Lowe, who helped me understand Indigenous worldviews and find my place in the Indigenous community planning work. My hope is that this presentation, both in having a warm and friendly way of teaching, as well as its content, shows that I have learned from my teachers, Westwood and my mother and my Indigenous community planning colleagues. So I've introduced myself. Up next, I'll talk a little bit more about what Indigenous community planning is. Let's start with that last word, planning. Planning is a profession. It's a field of academic study and it's a practice. At its most basic level, you and your family already plan. For example, your family has a way of determining when to go grocery shopping or what kind of tomatoes to grow on a patio next summer. If you were going to build a garage in your back alley, you have ways as a family and as a broader municipal government to decide where that garage would go, how large it could be, and who would use it. This is planning at its most basic level. It's a group of people figuring out what they want for their collective future and working towards that future. Municipal governments plan a lot. The city of Edmonton right now is in a planning process to figure out how to use parks and open spaces. So if you go to their website, you can see ways to be involved with their open spaces plan. You could attend an open house or you could write a letter. The report or the plan is written by municipal staff and it's based on public engagement. The process is guided by provincial legislation and municipal bylaws. It's a linear process and the government is responsible for making sure that it happens and then for implementing it. As a citizen, you are invited to show up and show up, but if you don't show up, the process will continue without you. You're being consulted. This is very, very different from Indigenous community planning. The basics are the same. It's still a group of people moving towards a better future, but the process is fundamentally different. Indigenous community planning is specific and distinct to each nation. This is important because each nation is unique and different and as different from one another as one river is to another. We all know that the river valley of the North Saskatchewan, for example, is beautiful and good for hiking in. And we also know that we will never find a live salmon spawning in the North Saskatchewan River. It's a distinct river different from all others. And so are all the nations in Canada. Nations are based in a specific place and Indigenous community planning recognizes that. Second, Indigenous community planning is holistic. It looks at all the parts of the community, including the past and the future, at the same time. So the green spaces are thought about at the same time as every other part of the community, like childcare or housing. This is critically important because the worldviews of Indigenous peoples who are planning themselves, who are doing the planning themselves, is holistic. These nations see the connections between things, and they do not want to plan in silos or in isolation. Third, Indigenous community planning is community-driven, guided, and controlled. 
Although the administration or a consultant might be responsible for the legwork of the planning process, the planning itself is done by community members. Outside experts are not going to tell them what to do in their community. Community members themselves determine what they need and how they are going to get there. Finally, Indigenous community planning is cyclical, meaning planning is always happening. Once the plan is in action, monitoring and evaluation begins, which inevitably leads the process to start all over again. Beyond these general four points, there's not many more statements I can make about Indigenous community planning as an overall framework, because it's extremely flexible. What works for one community is different than another. One nation might develop their plan primarily using elder circles, where another nation might plan using a series of winter engagement workshops. These are a few of the key principles, but what it looks like in one community to another community is very, very different. So I wanted to share with you a short video of Indigenous community planning in action in the community of Squath. They live on the North Fraser River near Hope, BC. This video is about two and a half minutes long, and it's an example of the community uh, describing and naming for themselves what their planning process is going to be like. Take notice and see how different it is from the green space plan that the city of Edmonton is conducting. Comprehensive Community Planning, or CCP, is a tool First Nations can use to design the future of their communities and home territories. It is comprehensive because it covers all aspects of community life, from education and housing to lands and resources. It asks for input from all community members in the form of ideas, stories, and dreams for the future to create a document outlining what a community wants and needs, the change communities want to see, and the steps required to achieve these goals. The Squelth Comprehensive Community Plan will cover the topics of culture, economic development, education, emergency preparedness, environmental protection, governance, health, housing, lands and resources, and fishing. The CCP will empower and strengthen the Squelth people by involving membership directly in the planning process. It will boost economic opportunities and entrepreneurism while protecting and enhancing Squelth lands and culture. Squelth is working with Land Forest People Consulting to help ask community members about what is important to them and to draft the final document. The Squelth team includes an elder rep and a youth rep to ensure the voices of the past and the future are heard. We are looking for input from all community members, old and young. The CCP process will take two years. In the first year, we are holding monthly workshops to gather in a circle and ask community members about what is important to them and what they want to see for the future. We are calling these meetings SCAP, the Helkamalan word for gathering, and we will cover one topic group at each SCAP. Lunch will be provided and all community members are encouraged to attend as many of the SCAP as possible. These meetings will be recorded and the information provided by membership will help write the final plan. The CCP will also draw on previous projects such as the Skaluk Membership Code, Economic Development Roadmap, and Land Use Plan. To ensure it stays true to the vision of the Squelth people, we will hold a final validation meeting to ensure we have heard the community's voice accurately. The second year will be spent implementing the plan. More information and regular updates can be found at these sites. All right, I hope you enjoyed that short video. I really admire their planning process and what this group is doing. So out of the planning consultation discussions, uh, pretty incredible projects often emerge for different nations. And here are two examples of projects. They both came out of the planning process. The first is that for the Haida community on Haida Gwaii, the community planning process identified that they wanted to restore and recenter the Haida language. They wanted to help more members learn to speak Haida and decided to do this through making a movie. 
they made a movie called Edge of the Knife uh, that was entirely made in the Haida language. And the movie has won international awards. Another example is the Musqueam Nation and their planning process identified the need for more housing for their members, especially families living off reserve who wanted to move home again. So they built large housing complexes specifically for those members. So let's just pull back a little and compare ICP to conventional planning. Western conventional planning is a lot like a ladder. It only goes in one direction. When decisions are made, someone at the top is making the decision. In the best case scenario, the people who make the decisions at least ask you your opinion about it. Citizens are engaged, but they're not involved in depth and they're not involved in implementation. In indigenous community planning, it's much more about collective decisions for the collective whole power and responsibility is shared. Each community plan is as different and distinct from one and another as a spider web is. It's shaped by the people, their culture, their land, and what kind of future they want. So Indigenous community planning is important because through it, Indigenous communities are able to move towards the future that they want through a process which they own and control. This is especially important because once settlers arrived, nations were forced to relinquish their planning power and were dominated by settler and colonial entities. ICP seeks to undo that harm and to support nations in moving towards what they think is important, not what outside planners who are usually white think is important or what non-Indigenous governments think is important. It's about what the nation wants as an act of self-determination. So this points at an interesting question. If Indigenous community planning is about nations moving towards their collective future, how the heck are non-Indigenous white women like me supposed to be involved? And that is where we are headed next. We, non-Indigenous Canadians, are having a hard look at ourselves and wondering, how can we do better? The world is unequal and unfair, so how should we behave in our attempts to fix things? These are my offerings as to what I've reached um, through my studies and experiences on this topic. The first is know how to be a good partner. Our role is to be a good partner and to share well with our Indigenous colleagues. This seems simple, but it's really hard to share even inside my own family. Working together is hard. In answering this question, I think of the teachings from my grandmother, Marion, who was a skilled fiber artist. As a child, she taught me to transfer yarn from her spinning wheel onto balls or skeins of yarn. To do this, two people have to work closely together. You have to pay attention to each other. You can't get sloppy and go faster than the other person. You can't get slow and build up the tension. You have to pay attention or the ball becomes sloppy and misshapen. So we need to work together and pay attention to each other and move at the right speed. Second is the importance of staying brave and curious. It's hard to wrestle with myself and my family about how I learned to be in the world. I was taught to assume that I was right and that how I saw the world as a white settler person was right. Unlearning this has required bravery, bravery to ask hard questions, to look at my family and how we have been taught to be and to still keep my heart up. Curiosity has been critical in undoing that toxic knot of wanting to be right. As a white person, I've been taught that being right is the most important thing, and curiosity helps ease this tension. I've learned to settle down and get uncomfortable and curious about why I am the way that I am. Be flexible. My model for this is always the willow trees from the bush of Northern Alberta. Willow trees are incredibly hard to break because they are so flexible. A willow tree knows what it is and where it stands and how it can adjust and move in the wind or rain or snow. Flexibility means not assuming I know something that I should. Flexibility means not assuming I know something, how something should look or act or be. And much like a willow tree, I need to know who I am. And I also need to be honest about how much I can change. Finally, I've learned to consider and reflect on what my culture has taught me. For example, growing up, I often heard white people in my childhood critique Indigenous leaders for having nice houses. But I noticed that my elected officials have always lived in nice houses. I was being taught that my leaders could have nice things, but not someone else's leaders. I've learned to stop and reflect on my family, my broader culture, and what I've been taught. 
My attitudes and preferences are not inherently right or correct. They come from the culture I was raised in. They are the goggles through which I see the world. So this pretty much brings us full circle. I hope that you've learned something about Indigenous community planning and the work uh, of supporting nations in their self-determination. I'm including a few links here if you would like more information. Um, later, there's some wonderful videos of nations explaining their work and the great things that they do. Thank you, Dawn. That was just as good as I was hoping. Please join us for another hymn played by Steve Bell, Sing and Rejoice. Our closing words is a continuation from the book I was reading earlier, One Drum by Richard Wagamisi. A pervasive quiet descends, and soon there is only the crackle of fire, the snap of logs. Everyone breathes more deeply, everyone relaxes. This scenario happens everywhere around the world when people gather in a circle around a fire in the night. I believe it is because we all carry a specific cellular memory based on the spiritual feelings of togetherness, safety, and belonging. It is the basis of our human identity, community, and it formed in all of us a long, long time ago. There is a particular magic that exists when the world is reduced to flame and the sound of a human voice talking. We all respond to that setting like children, wrapped with wonder and entranced by the possibility of story. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I think I might've skipped a song. So let's sing along with Steve Bell, Love Will Guide Us.
Next week, our service leader is Lisa Stein, and our guest speaker is our very own Reverend Ann Barker. It's October 31st, the day where many hold a vision that the veil between the worlds is the thinnest. This morning, we will reflect on thresholds, what this, might, what this vision might, might mean in your life, what thresholds do you straddle? Join us for a quiet, low light, tender service.